Welcome, everyone. This is uh, Igor with my guest here, uh, who is Maria on Instagram. Maria, please give your Instagram handle. Yes, hello, everybody. My Instagram handle is Strong Maria Strong, and I'm on TikTok as well, believe it or not. Modern lady, I am. <laughs> on That's TikTok, right. I'm Strong Maria. <laughs> Very progressive. Um, so I came across your, your Instagram channel, and, you, and you're posting a lot of inspirational pictures and messages um, especially for women over 40. So, I mean, you weren't always over 40. So how did you get your start? How did you get started in fitness to begin with? All right. Well, I'm 53 years old and I began my fitness path when I was around 20. I'm Bolivian. So I began in Bolivia. I was going through um, a really dark phase in my life, a very difficult moment in my life. And so um, when I was going out with a fellow who said, let's try the gym. But the problem was that at that time, nobody, no women went to the gym. And so when I began going to the gym and working out, I was literally the only female going to a gym in Bolivia at that time. So it's an interesting story because I got highly criticized. When I began training, I loved it. Immediately, I loved it because I began feeling strong. I, began, I mean, when one's 20, you immediately begin seeing your muscles and your body changing. And so I began seeing that change. I began feeling the strength in my body and I loved it. But because it was like the 1980s in Bolivia, I got criticized a lot. Like people were saying, why is she going to an all male gym? Why is she wearing shorts? She's getting too big. And I wasn't getting too big. Like yeah. I'm, a, I'm a small lady, <laughs> but I faced um, a lot of controversy among my friends and among society a lot. So much so that for a little while there, I actually stopped training because I felt so much social pressure of, you know, you shouldn't train, nice ladies don't do that. What are you doing in this place? Um, but I continued because, uh, like I said, I was going through a dark, a, a very difficult moment. My mom got very, very sick. And it was one of the few things that actually I felt control over and um, made me feel better. It just made life a little better for me. And to this day, it's, well, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a gym junkie. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, as I, as I write in my book on, on mental health, one of the best ways to cope with it, with, with, uh, your life being out of control is being in the gym and you having control over your own workouts. Uh, so it sounds like you, you got there early. You, you just, you, you, you just were doing it intuitively. Now, how long, were you exercising before you kind of, um, uh, I guess, gave in to the pressure of the other women of society to stop exercising for a while? Maybe a good three years. So enough that, um, like, I, I I didn't look muscular because I'm, I'm, I mean, I have a lot of muscle mass, but I'm not a big woman. But enough that people could begin seeing a difference and thinking, oh my God, her legs are too big. What are those little squares on her abs? <laughs> it was a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> enough for people to 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 think she she's too big she's too muscular you know the shoulders don't look nice and yeah enough so um i probably gave in you know what to be honest with you i um at that time i was almost comp ready i was ready for competition i, I looked very very good i was very very strong um i have a, an athletic body and so um I mean, I hate admitting this, but I could have competed at the South Americans, but because pressure was so strong on me, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And it's really embarrassing to, to confess this because, um, you know, one always likes to hear success stories of people saying, I didn't give in to social pressure, yeah, no, <laughs> but course. my story, really I actually, yeah. And it's, it's, I hate telling it, but I do tell it because because social pressure is a real thing and fit shaming is a real thing. And for me, yeah. uh, in the 1980s and 1970s, I was fit shamed. What can I tell you? I was fit shamed into not competing and I didn't. And mm -hmm. I could have, I honestly could have won. I looked really good. Like I looked very, very strong. Um, yeah. I'm a very strong woman. Like I have a very powerful body. I think I could have won the South Americans, but I didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> and then uh, how long did it take for you to get back in the gym? I think maybe I stopped for a year. I lost a lot of muscle mass in that time. Um, 
and then I thought, no, this, I love doing this. This is me. I'm not, I'm not a cardio bunny. I don't like, you know, classes. <laughs> I don't like spinning or zoom. Well, there wasn't zoom at that time, but whatever lessons they taught ladies, yeah. I hated it. So I went back and I haven't looked back ever since. I mean, since that time I've had three kids, I've had moves, I've had um, ups and downs like everybody does. I've had you know, yeah. different things go on in my life. But I've always kept going. That was the only time that I stopped. It was a short period of time in my mid twenties because um, I just threw society off by yeah. being what I am, what I am today. Yeah. Now, was there a trigger event that got you back into lifting, or was it just like you missed it? Uh, did I ever compete again? So I'm just going to close my door. No, I, I I missed it because then I got pregnant. Um, and I have three kids, one after the other. So I missed it. I, I missed my opportunity. And I, I'm okay sharing that because I think that it's also, it's nice to know success stories, but it's also nice to know how, you know, you have to be careful with your words and what, and letting people do their thing because you can affect what other people, you know, when one is young, you're very sensitive to what other people, I mean, I would never not train because of what people say now, but I'm 53. I don't care what people think about me. But when you're in your mid twenties, you're a lot more sensitive to what people are telling you. And I think the world has changed a lot today though. I think today people are more like, you know, you be you just go for yep. it. But at my time, there wasn't a you be you. It's like, you need to conform to what society thinks a woman should be. Yes. And um, I did, but it didn't work for me. I was really miserable. <laughs> oh, that, and then you got back into lifting and you, and, and you started enjoying things again. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny because the body I had at that time, and maybe the body I have now, the physique I had at that time is the physique that everybody chases today. So I yes. got super criticized because I had this amazing six pack. I still do. I have a very nice six pack. But at that time, like, you know, everybody thought that stomach looks horrible, like it's too thin to this. Too that. And now everybody wants that. It's really weird. <laughs> it's really weird because you were a pioneer. I mean, yeah. I mean, I got literally lynched for the physique that today everybody wants. Wow. You were 30 years ahead of your time. Yes, sir. <laughs> huh. So yeah. funny. And then how has your training evolved over the years from your 20s to your 30s, 40s and now? Well, um, I mean, I began lifting at an old time gym, like a, just an old school gym full of men. It was iron. It was like literally rusty iron, a dirty dungy gym in Bolivia. Like it was a dungeon. Um, and so I just did what everybody else did, whatever. Like you just trained to death, killed yourself at the gym. You didn't worry about injuries or you didn't worry about uh, recovery or progression. You just died every single time. <laughs> right. um, so <laughs> that has changed, of course. Now um, I have a plan. I have a schedule. I don't train to failure. I usually train um, two reps below failure. So I am very methodical about the way I train. I train five days a week. I rest two. I go through cycles. So I have deloads. I don't train like a beast anymore. Right. And um, it looks like that is... <laughs> I think you know what I think that's what's kept me injury free at my age I mean I'm 53 I lift really heavy I deadlift twice my weight I squat wow. uh one and a half times my weight so I'm, I'm really strong but I'm not I, I don't have any injuries and I haven't I mean I haven't had any injuries and I think it's just because I rest I follow I follow protocol I rest, yeah. I have my deload weeks, I don't kill myself. Like I trained like Arnold did. <laughs> because yeah. Arnold always said, you have to train till you die. That's not the way to train. But you know, right. the other thing that changed is that um, I didn't know, what, I didn't even know what protein was at that time. I mean, we just ate whatever we ate and that was it. Nobody thought about protein. Not even the big bodybuilders in my gym at that time. So of yeah. course that has changed. Like now, yeah. um, crazy fanatic about eating enough protein because I'm a small woman and because I'm older I make sure I get enough protein in absolutely yeah now how do you figure out how much how much protein is enough for you well I usually calculate it's one pound 
per one gram per pound of body weight per day. So um, yeah. I'm about 123 pounds right now. So I eat, I probably eat about 130 grams of protein a day. So just to repeat, yeah. it's one gram per pound of body weight per day. Yeah, that's and more that's or less. Quick message because in, for for a lot of my female clients, I find when, when I, I ask them for a food log, and they say, "Oh yeah, I eat so much protein." When I actually count it, it's between 30 and 60 grams. And I say, well, 30 and 60 grams is good if you're, if you're 50 pounds and you're 11 years old. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, one gram per pound is a good target to shoot for. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I think women, if they just make that change, even if they don't exercise, if, ju if they just add more protein into their diet, it makes a huge difference a yeah. huge difference. Like they begin seeing a little bit of muscle, at least they retain the muscle they have and it helps you to lose um, weight just because it satiates. It's the more, it's protein is the most satiating of all macros. So yep. it makes you feel more satisfied. So just adding protein makes a really big difference for a woman yeah. and a man, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, especially for my female clients who are having a hard time getting enough protein and I tell them, let's get about at least it's at least 70% of what you actually need for now. And then eventually we'll work our way up. And they say, yeah. I can't eat that much protein. I, 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 give, I do the numbers for them. You know, this is not that much. One gram of protein is four calories. If you're getting 130 grams of protein per day, well, 130 times four is only 520, gram, 520 calories. If you're eating yeah. 2,000, 2,500 calories per day, that's less than 25%. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not a lot of protein. It's the right amount of protein. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and also now there's nice protein shakes. Like in my time when I began, like I used to eat egg whites until I died <laughs> just to get <laughs> enough protein. Yeah. Um, but now there's uh, the protein shakes today are so good. So yeah. if you can't eat food, enough food of protein, then just have a protein shake, 25 yeah. grams of protein in a protein shake. And that really helps. Yeah. Nice. And then um, you, you mentioned a little bit about your, your current routine. Um, you are actually testing five days per week. You don't go to failure, but what does it look like? I mean, are you doing full body workouts, body part splits, upper lower splits, something else? You know what? I, I personally design uh, my own training program. I usually design it in six months. So I vary, not that I need to vary because I focus on the main lift, but I vary it just because I my, mentally I need to switch. So right now I'm doing um, push pull legs. So I do, uh, the, uh, one day I train just my lower body. One day I do chest, shoulders and triceps. And one day I do back and biceps. That's the way I'm splitting it now. Right. Um, other times um, after six weeks, I rest a week. I do a deload. I don't stop training, but I just do 50% of everything. And then I do anterior posterior. And that's super fun. So I just, I train the whole front of my body. And yep. then the next day I train the whole back of my body. Not that there's any magic to it, but it just gives you a little bit, it makes it a little bit more fun. Yep. And then I rest for a week. And then my next um, uh, program is I do upper upper and lower. So I one day I do my entire upper and then lower. So yep. it just switches it up mentally for yep. me. And it just keeps it a little bit fun. Yeah, but keeps it all of... Yeah, yeah, but all of my training program is based on the main compound lifts. Like I lift heavy and I do, I really do 80% are the compounds. So for uh, the people listening and not, who don't know what compound lifts are, they're the lifts that work more than one muscle group. So uh, for example, a squat works your quads, your hamstrings and your glutes, that's a compound. So it's a very efficient way of training because you're, you get a lot of bang for your buck. Or if you're doing like a bench press, you're working your chest, the front of your shoulders and your triceps. It's a lot better to do a bench press than just to separate and just do your chest or just to do like if yeah. you just do triceps. It's a little muscle, it works, but you're not getting as much bang for your buck. So I do 80% compound exercises and about 20% um, isolation exercises, which just work one muscle group. And I do it like my biceps, my triceps, uh, the smaller right. muscles. Right. Mm -hmm. And do you do any cardio, any stretching? I do stretching. I don't do a lot of <laughs> I walk my dogs. I have three dogs. They were fighting here a little while ago. Um, and I walk them about 40 minutes every day at a good pace. That's it. So that that is cardio, right? Yes, the job. But I don't do cardio. I don't do cardio. That's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard. But you know what? A lot of women think 
that cardio is the way to reach their goals. And it's not like I've gone through a cardio phase before and I look so different. If I showed you my cardio pictures, um, yes, I'm thin, but I'm gaunt. Like I look gaunt. I have zero abs, zero arms, zero ass, zero, zero. Like I look, I, I don't look, I don't look like I have a form. It's what right. weights have given me the sh that shape that I have. So right. they've just filled me in. They give me legs and they give me a little bit of arm. Um, it has, it's a, it's a huge difference. If you see my cardio body, um, I even had a little bit of a pot belly when I was doing cardio. Like I didn't burn it. Amazing. So, um, you know, Mike Matthews wrote uh, his book, uh, Thinner, Leaner, Stronger for Women. Yeah. And he became famous saying exactly that, that women who do too much cardio become what we call skinny fat. So you might lose the weight, maybe, but you lose skinny fat. You don't, you know, a, a woman who does a lot of cardio, you don't look at her and go, oh my God, what an athletic body. That's awesome. You yeah. don't. It's more a weightlifter's body that you think wow, that woman looks so athletic and so yeah. toned. Right. And of course, um, you know, we, we're natural bodybuilders. Like I, I've never taken any steroids or anything. So a natural women's lifters uh, body for a female is very athletic looking. It's not yes. big at all. Yeah, exactly. I've heard the saying that sometimes the routines that make, uh, that make men bulky make women toned. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now. Yeah, currently you're a fitness coach, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, how long have you been a fitness coach for? 30 years. Okay, <laughs> so right from the beginning. 30 years. But you know what? I'm actually transitioning. This is kind of interesting. I'm transitioning because I've been a coach for 30 years. I did on, I've been doing online work for the last two years. So I began before COVID hit. But um, I've been calling, getting a lot of attention from the media. Uh, probably because I'm 53 and I'm fit. Um, and so I'm actually going to switch to be an influencer now because I have a right. lot of brands who want me to represent them. Um, Congratulations. And yeah, yeah, thank you. It, it's a leap of faith. I got to tell you, I'm a little nervous about it, but I officially made the announcement to my clients uh, last week. And uh, they were, of course, very sad, but I, I need to give it a try. I need to change something. So I've changed. Like, if you look at my Instagram or my Facebook account, yeah. my TikTok account, it all says fitness slash lifestyle influencer, because that's my new title as of last week. <laughs> awesome. Well, best of luck in this new venture. And uh, second, last question to what do you attribute your longevity? I mean, a lot of, a lot of, well, not just going people, uh, they get on an exercise program and it goes great for a little while and they kind of like plateau and they kind of fall off and then they get back into it a few months or a year later and they, 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 they start, they stop, they start, they stop. You started, you stopped once in your mid twenties. And then you, as far as I understand, you haven't stopped since, right? You know what? Yes and no, because life happens and life has happened to me. But through time, I kept going. So, for example, in all of this time, I've been training 30 years. I've had kids. I've had three babies. I've moved. I've just had all sorts of things happen to me, like everybody, right? And if I needed to stop, like for a pregnancy, like a major event, like a pregnancy, sure. I knew in my head I was going to get back to it. So I did my very best while I was pregnant. And I'm I had my baby and I probably couldn't train for a while, but I always got back to it. So if there's one thing I can, one tip I can give your listeners is consistency trumps it all. Yes. I've trained under circumstances there that were like way below comfortable or, or adequate for me just because of I was in different situations. I lived in Brazil in a very small city. I kept training with whatever I had. I just continued training always with whatever I had. And a lot of people, what happens is that they begin a program. First of all, they do too much, so they get overwhelmed. That is the number one reason why people drop off. They just do too much. So they do too much and they cut their calories too much. So they get way overwhelmed and they're hungry and they think, oh, the hell with this. And um, then they get discouraged and the discouragement just becomes a vicious circle and it's hard to get back on with me i always thought okay this is temporary if i'm moving like i moved from canada to the yeah. holland from holland to houston from houston to brazil i thought okay i'm moving i need two months 
just to gather myself. I'm going to get back yeah. into it. And then I did little squats and lunges and whatever I could in the middle. And then I got back to it. Consistency right. trumps it all. Consistency mm -hmm. through time. So if you stop training for a week or you fall off your diet for a week or two weeks or even a month, you're not going to die. Nothing's going to happen. Just get back into it. That's right. the biggest tip. Just get back on. Yeah. And I Amazing. always did. I always got back on. So I guess the, the key in, in your case is that when you took a break, it was a planned break, not an unplanned break. And you already had a, before you took the break, you had a date in mind of when am I going to get back into it? Well, yes and no, because I mean, I've lived a long time. <laughs> I've, I've had all sorts of planned and unplanned breaks. I've had moments in my life where, you know, you know, shit happens and you just can't train for whatever reason like even covid right i mean who would have ever imagined that the gyms would close like even at my gym i go to a big commercial gym and everybody like all the bodybuilders were like they're not going to close this gym like impossible what are we going to do we're going to die everybody nobody imagined that it was going to close we were a year in and it just opened again yeah. so um i've had unplanned planned and unplanned yeah. And sometimes and life happens, but you have to yeah. know that it happens. Yeah, for sure. But you mentioned even as you're taking a break from your formal workouts, you're doing little lunges or squats or, uh, or, or push-ups here and there. I try if I can. Like yeah. that's how I got through little kids, right? When I had little kids, like my kids are two years apart. And so people ask me, how did you ever keep fit? Like when you had a one, three and five year old, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do you keep fit? Well, this is how I did it. I did it little by little. Like when the three of them were taking naps, I did 10 squats, like nice. air squats. And then when the when they were playing for exactly five seconds, I did little lunges. And it's better than nothing. It didn't keep Absolutely. me like ultra fit, but at least when they got a little bit bigger, um, I got quite a bit. Now, if you add five minutes here, and five minutes there, and eight minutes here, you can actually do quite a lot. Yeah. I often, in my, in my seminars, I often say a five minute workout is better than a zero minute workout. Absolutely. And there's no reason why to do just one five minute. Like maybe you could do three yep. five minutes throughout yep. the day. Like one in the morning, as soon as you get up, one before, you know, once you put the kids to bed or whatever's going on in your life and one in the middle and you got yep, 15 exactly. minutes in. It's better than nothing. That's for sure. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I know I, I know. I said this was going to be like your last, well, my last question, but I have a couple more. Um, with when you were pregnant, did you stop exercising right away when you got pregnant, or did you, did you train for a couple of trimesters? I trained all the way through, but very mindfully. Um, I'm small. I'm I like I have a very small frame, so and I had huge tummies like this. But yeah. at the end of my third trimester, I couldn't move very much, but I did a little bit. I mainly walked. Yeah. But I did like maybe little air squats and I had my little weights. Like I was a little yeah. mindful. Right. Okay. So even throughout your pregnancies, you still exercised. Um, you just, um, of course, adjusted the exercise routine. You wouldn't put one and a half times your body weight in a squat or double body weight in a deadlift. <laughs> uh, but you still exercised all the way through. I still exercise all the way through. You know what? I think the benefit is not only that you keep your activity up, but it's also mental. Because if you think... If you all of a sudden stop for two years, it's so hard to get back into it mentally. Yeah. But if you just don't stop, even if you do a little bit or a lot lighter or just like whatever you can, mentally you think you're still in the game. So I was still in the game. Didn't matter if yeah. I did five minutes. Yeah. Mentally so, playing with yourself really helped. Yes. Uh, and that it's it's not like it's not what it sounds like. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but and, I mean mental tricks, right? Like I play mental tricks. So one mental trick for me has always been like if I can't do something, even if I do a little bit. Like when I go on holidays, I can't like fully train, but I I go to the gym, I do a little bit. I want to enjoy my holiday. I don't want to be killing myself at the you know. Yeah. But just enough so I feel I've kept it up that I haven't like gone look for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And it's encouraging to know that it takes a lot less to maintain than to actually make progress. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot less. A lot yeah. less. Yeah. Between mm -hmm. 33 and 50% of what it took to actually make the progress. Yeah. So encouraging yeah, to yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. before we before we sign off, any any last words, any last messages for uh, for the viewers? I think the biggest thing, the biggest tip I can give anybody is just keep going. Just keep going. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what you think. Just keep going. And I 
think that is the biggest tip I can give anybody. Life happens, holidays happen, birthdays happen. You fall off the wagon, you get back on, but just keep going. That really is the secret, honest to goodness. It's my secret for sure. Beautiful. And it's, and it's worked fantastically well for you. And the proof of that is on your Instagram channel and your TikTok, which you want one more time. What's your, where's your Instagram? So Instagram is strong, Maria strong. And um, my TikTok is strong, Maria. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll chat again uh, sometime soon. Thank you so much, Igor. It was a pleasure to talk to you. My pleasure.